Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. Another one of the statues here in Statuary Hall is this one of Lew Wallace of Indiana. His father was the governor of that state, and Lew Wallace himself held several offices in Indiana. He also served as a distinguished military officer during the Civil War and was the youngest man ever to attain the rank of Major General. He later became governor of New Mexico and then served as a U.S. diplomat. He is perhaps best known, however, not for his military or political accomplishments, but rather for his literary works. General Lew Wallace is the author of the forever immortalized work, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, the classic novel about the life of Judah Ben-Hur. That work, first printed in 1880, not only swept the nation, but it swept the world, being translated into numerous languages. Interestingly, the impetus for this work began in 1876 when General Wallace conversed at length with Robert Ingersoll, a co-officer from the Civil War. Ingersoll, titled by the press as the great agnostic, was the national evangelist for atheism. In his conversation with General Wallace, Ingersoll first forcefully asserted that there was no God, no devil, and no afterlife, and then challenged Wallace to try to prove that Jesus was the Son of God. Wallace was disturbed by the conversation and found himself ashamed of his own ignorance about the topics raised by Ingersoll and especially of his own lack of knowledge about the life of Jesus. Wallace therefore set out to research the life of Christ as well as the Jewish and Roman cultures of that day. He studied numerous works including those by Josephus and Edward Gibbon and he eventually made a trip to the Holy Land to trace the steps of Christ. As a result of his research two things happened to General Lew Wallace. One, he became a Christian and two, he wrote the book that even today remains an international classic. Interestingly, not only did Ben-Hur become the best-selling novel of the 19th century, but it probably did more than any other single work to undermine Robert Ingersoll's national message on atheism. Ben-Hur inspired Christians as few works before had done. Its effect was felt across the nation and all the way to the White House. In fact, President Ulysses S. Grant who had not read a novel in 10 years, made an exception with Ben-Hur and read it through within a day and a half. Grant's statue is here in the rotunda, as is the statue of President James A. Garfield, and President Garfield thought the book was so important that he penned a nationally published letter recommending Ben-Hur. President Garfield even asked General Wallace to write more such novels to benefit and strengthen the nation. General Lew Wallace, commemorated by a statue here in Statuary Hall, was one of the most influential Christian authors of the 19th century. Can I just tell you how impacting you holding original documents of sermons preached inside of our U.S. Capitol building is when you think of what a generation of people, our, gen our generation, were taught in schools as to what separation of church and state, that entire meaning, and what we really are as a people is absolutely proved. We're not making this up. Right, You're reading right, right. transcripts and original documents are being used on this show. For example, of these sermons that's that were right. preached in front of U.S. presidents, that's who we are that's as who a we people. Are. And, and what's cool is, I mean, we've got just stacks of, of sermons preached and the different guys who preached them and, and but we also have the, the corroborating records of folks like John Quincy Adams who attended there. And you find out the presidents who attended there because the people would write about, oh, President so-and-so was in today and he sat here and he brought this person with him. And as Jefferson would come to church on horseback, that wasn't James Madison style. James Madison went to church at the U.S. Capitol. James Madison would arrive for church in a coach and four. Four big old white horses drawn his, <laughs> his coat. So when President Madison got to church, everybody knew he was there. Things no. haven't changed much. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. But it, it's that same kind of thing. There, there's personalities and differences of styles. And Abraham Lincoln went to church there, and, and that was where he went. And, and James Buchanan, all these different presidents went to church. All these when did senators. It stop, Dave? It stopped sometime in, in the late 19th century. It, there was no official act of Congress that caused it to stop. There was no controversy, no dissension, nothing in the records. It just kind of faded out. This man is Alexander Hamilton. You'll find a statue of him in the rotunda. Not only is Alexander Hamilton a signer of the Constitution, but by being an author of the Federalist Papers, 
He's considered one of the three men most responsible for us having the Constitution today. You may recall that Alexander Hamilton died a premature death at the hands of Aaron Burr in a duel in 1804. Although trained in the art of war and weaponry, Hamilton was one of those who disapproved of personal duels. He tried to dissuade Burr from the duel and even offered other recourses, all of which Burr refused. Hamilton at last conceded to his friends that if he did not face Burr in a duel, he knew he publicly would be branded as a coward and his own personal reputation would be so tarnished that he could never again hold public office. One other consequence of Hamilton's untimely death was that it permanently halted the formation of a religious society Hamilton had proposed. What was that society? Hamilton suggested that it be named the Christian Constitutional Society and listed two goals for its formation. First, the support of the Christian religion. And second, the support of the Constitution of the United States. This organization was to have numerous clubs throughout each state which would meet regularly and work to elect to office those who reflected the goals of the Christian Constitutional Society. This proposed society, whose first goal was to support the Christian religion, was the design of Alexander Hamilton, another of the many men of faith who had a significant influence on the founding of American government. Not only did we have church in the Capitol, the, the Capitol Church, but there were three other churches that also used the Capitol building for their church. Oh so you had First Presbyterian, you had Capitol Hill Presbyterian, you had First Congregational. I mean, various churches used the U.S. Capitol as their church home. If they were building a new building in D.C., they would move in there while they're building the new building. And, and so you, you literally had church services going in the hall of the house. You had church service going in the Senate chamber. You had church service going in the Supreme Court chamber. And yes, the Supreme Court did meet in the Capitol. It wasn't until 1935 that they got a separate building and moved out from under the watchful eye of Congress. But you have four churches meeting in the Capitol building. I get this. This, this concept that is a secular building filled with secular-minded people, absolute nonsense. On any given week in Congress, we have 120 members of Congress active in one of the four major Bible studies in Congress. We have great chaplains at the Congress. They preach great sermons and do great ministry at Congress. We have great members of Congress who are still godly Christian statesmen, just as we've had for 200 years. That is not a secular building. Some secular activities go there. But because of what we see on the media, we think the whole thing is secular, and it's not. So when we look at the U.S. Capitol, we're looking at what was a huge church, but it was also a church, if you will, filled with a lot of Christian statesmen who acted out of principle and conviction. That secular building is one of the greatest religious museums in American history. For more information on the American Heritage Series, or to find books and other resources, visit wallbuilders.com. Through the American Heritage Series, renowned historian David Barton communicates our nation's forgotten, godly foundations and encourages us to once again view history through a truthful lens. For only when we recognize and embrace God's hand in our history can America become all that it was intended to be. Through Wall Builders, historian David Barton seeks to rebuild the walls of America's unique religious, moral, and constitutional heritage by educating the public and encouraging people of faith to become active in strengthening America's great foundations. For more information on how you can become involved, visit wallbuilders.com.